Hi, thanks for tuning in to episode number 56 of the Doctor Podcast Show. We really appreciate you watching. And please subscribe and follow Dr. Podcasts. And if you like this episode, which I'm sure you will, please also click on the like button and also the repost button. And we appreciate any comments you send along as well. Today we have a great guest, Dr. Andrew Goldstone. Dr. Goldstone is a heart surgeon and specializes in heart transplants in children. Today we're going to be talking about heart transplants and we're going to be talking about pig heart transplants into humans, which is uh, incredible uh, surgery that's being done more and more these days, and we'll learn all about that. So this will be a very exciting program. Dr. Goldstone is an assistant professor of surgery and cardiovascular surgery at the Columbia University Medical Center here in New York City. It's one of the top uh, programs for heart surgery in the country and in the world, and one of the uh, top major medical centers uh, in the world as well. Dr. Goldstone specializes in uh, pediatric heart surgery, pediatric heart transplants, and also uh, doing surgery in adults with uh, congenital uh, heart disease. So, uh, Andrew, thanks very much for uh, taking the time to come in today. You are a busy guy, I'm sure, so I really uh, appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So tell us about uh, the kind of training that you need to, to uh, become a heart surgeon like you are. After the four years of medical school, how many additional years of training did you need? Um, a lot. A uh, lot. Uh, yeah, almost too many, I would say. Too many. Uh, I interviewed uh, another heart surgeon, and he had the same answer. It was a lot and too many. Yeah. But, I mean, it's, it's an insane amount of training, I think. You know, we talk about the 10,000 hour principle. I think it's more for us like 30,000 hours 30, when you add up all the residency. But um, so let's see, I did five years in med school because I did a, a dedicated research fellowship. I had a grant uh, that I got, a Doris Duke research grant. Uh, so I prolonged that by a year. Right. Uh, and then I went into residency and there's a couple different ways to be a heart surgeon these days. Uh, right when I was coming out, there was a brand new pathway where you could go straight out of medical school into dedicated cardiothoracic surgery training. Uh, and that's a six-year curriculum with mandatory research years, at least at my program there was. Right. And I trained at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, which was one of the first programs of that, of that type. Columbia was also one of the first programs. Uh, and so I did a PhD in the middle of my residency. So I did nine years in residency in heart surgery. Uh, and, then, uh, and then I decided to take the leap of faith to become a pediatric heart surgeon, uh, which is an additional accredited fellowship after you're a fully trained heart surgeon. And that was an extra year. Now they've moved that to two years. So I made it out a little bit faster. So about 10 years of training uh, after medical school. 10 years. You must be ready to retire now. I'm close. <laughs> I'm close. <laughs> well, that shows, though, your dedication and your expertise because heart transplant surgery, obviously uh, very important, and you really have to be an expert at it. So 30,000 hours uh, is essential. Yeah. You mentioned you also got a PhD. What, what's your PhD in? Yeah, so uh, my PhD is in, uh, I did at Stanford, and that was in epidemiology and, and clinical research. And so uh, we, I used large databases, so big data and administrative databases to, sort of, to answer questions that would be hard to answer with a randomized clinical trial. Um, and uh, some of them have gone on to even change our guidelines in heart surgery. So uh, that was pretty, um, I'm very proud of that work. Right, so big data is very important even in, yeah. in heart surgery. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Uh, how did you develop an interest in, in heart surgery and then a super subspecialty of pediatric heart surgery? It's a great question. Um, I became interested in heart surgery uh, during that extra research year in med school. I went through med school sort of liking everything. Right. Um, everything except uh, psychiatry, to be honest <laughs> with you. And, and uh, th but 
everything else I really like. So I came out with this problem of like, well, what am I going to do? do? And then I kind of, I was, I gravitated towards surgery mostly because uh, I liked the hands-on approach. I liked how, um, how, it, how much of an, uh, fast and acute impact you can have on someone's life. And then my research here happened to be in heart surgery and I got to see heart surgery. And I think once you see it, it's hard to think anything else. But, right. and I felt that between that and orthopedic surgery, they can have some of the biggest impacts on people's lives. I mean, uh, outside of uh, ophthalmology where you can change someone's sight. But right. uh, I think for us, it's you can be bedridden or about to die and you can walk out of the hospital with a new lease on life. And right. so um, that was an incredible feeling for me to see that, the gift that you can give. And then on top of it, um, the physiology is very uh, interesting. Uh, and then, uh, but, and, and simple, I think, when I was in the adult world and then I chose to make it more complicated when right. I got to pediatrics. Now, pediatric switch was more a personal thing because my own son needed surgery, my second son uh, oh. needed surgery. And um, I had never thought about pediatrics. It's a harder, it's harder to get a job. It's more training. Um, it's more stressful, like operating on people's children. Right. Um, uh, so I never really thought about it as something that I was going to do. And then I sort of gravitated to it afterwards. And because I could, I saw the gift you can give to uh, someone's family yeah. and right. I witness that every day when I come home and I see my kid thriving you know and so for me it was a I think there was a personal push toward doing pediatrics and uh, I think I can relate to the families a little bit more so it's a very interesting life-changing experience for the child as, as well as the uh, parents what are the most common types of heart surgery that you do in the pediatric age group? Yeah, so uh, I'd say peds is the largest part of my, um, of my patient uh, volume that I do and that I take care of. Uh, surgeries are so, you could not, in pediatrics, the one thing that's interesting about it is you might not do the same surgery twice in a month, right? Like, because there's so much variation. Every case is different. Um, but the mm -hmm. most common things are, you know, fixing holes in the heart, like ventricular septal defects, uh, but it ranges all the way to treating single ventricle disease, so kids born with only one pumping chamber in their heart and having to reroute that circulation so that it can accommodate that. Um, to uh, even trying to do surgeries to recruit and grow a slightly small ventricle into a bigger ventricle so that we can then use it uh, over a number of surgeries. Uh, so it gets complicated, but uh, those are sort of, it runs the gamut what, what we do. Right. So that's incredible. What you're doing there is, is basically changing the mechanics and the physiology of the heart. And every case is different because every child has a different defect or abnormality of the heart. Absolutely. Right. That's why you need all that training because when you get in there in the surgery, you don't know exactly what you'll encounter and you have to be ready for anything and everything. Exactly. What about uh, in adults? Uh, I know you treat congenital heart disease in adults, uh, people who are born with abnormalities. What, what are some of the common things there? Yeah. So. Um, it's a great question. Uh, you know, when you look at the landscape of heart disease, one of the fastest growing populations are the adults that were born with congenital heart disease because mm -hmm. we've gotten so good at pediatric heart surgery, thankfully, those kids are growing up to be adults now. Right. right? And so a lot of what adult congenital heart disease surgery is, is treating those patients that may have had surgery as kids that now have new problems that arise as they grow older. Uh, so those might be replacing a pulmonary valve and someone who had a tetralogy of Fallot repair, uh, which is like the most common blue baby syndrome, uh, or that would be like one of the most common things, but it can get way more complicated, such as things where um, people have been put down the Fontan pathway, which are those people that have one ventricle and they might need new, new valves or more complicated surgeries or changing up of their Fontan pathways uh, to even things of just 
valve replacements in patients who are born with only one valve in the middle of their heart or things like that. So uh, it runs the gamut, but uh, it is the fastest growing form of heart disease in, in, our, in, our, uh, in heart surgery. Mm. The various defects that you mentioned in the heart that people are born with, are, are those genetic, environmental, or combination? Do we know? I don't think we know. We uh, know. You know, we don't have a gene for every uh, defect. Sometimes, you know, we, and, and sometimes patients don't want to have genetic screening, mm. but uh, it, it's not that common where you, it's not like Marfan syndrome where you have one gene that like you identify or right. Williams syndrome where you have one gene in the elastin, you, you know, where you have uh, uh, a specific gene and a phenotype, right? Like uh, a lot of these um, uh, heart defects that we have or lesions are, are not necessarily associated with specific gene. Hmm. Do they tend to run in families though? Like if somebody has a tetralogy of LO, is there increased risk that other relatives would have? There's it? definitely a, an association. There, is. Um, there can be a higher risk of it. Um, there are, but it's not a given. Not a given. So tell us about the history of heart transplants. I think the first one was done in, in the 60s, 1960s in uh, yeah. South Africa, right? Yes, the first successful one. Successful. Yeah. Uh, and depends on how you define success, but right. uh, Christian Barnard uh, at, um, in South Africa performed the first uh, successful human orthotopic heart transplant. So orthotopic meaning the heart was put in the same place as the original heart. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also heterotopic where you can put it in different places. Really? And keep the regular heart. We don't do that these days, but right. the people were experimenting with that, especially back in those days. So that was, that first one was, I think, in uh, 19, at the end of 1967 or something like that, right. like December of 1967. Uh, and I think that patient lived like two weeks or three weeks or something like that. So it was, it was deemed a success and the whole world was watching. Right. And then he quickly performed another one uh, thereafter, uh, I think a month or two later um, in 1968. And they lived, some months uh, longer and so and then it took off I think in 1968 uh, because a lot of the research actually he wasn't the one doing the research behind this Dr. Shumway and colleagues at in Stanford were the ones really doing all the dog research behind I see. Uh, or the topic heart transplantation but it took off around the world in 1968 and I think there were like over a hundred heart transplants done in 1968. So once um, he got the ball rolling, yeah. other people followed. But the mortality was very high. Very high. I think like a 18% one year survival or something like that. So mm. very, very low. And so the enthusiasm then declined, but some few, a few groups just such as Dr. Barnard continued to, um, and Dr. Shumway at Sanford continued to press on until it became what it, uh, what it is today, which is uh, a very successful operation. Right, so about how many heart transplants are done in the USA annually, approximately? I think somewhere in the 4,000 range, 4, actually. Yeah, so it, it is increasing every year, uh, and we are trying to find more ways to find donor hearts. Uh, you know, there are different categories of them, and. Uh, that's always the issue. There are more people living with heart failure and people on the wait list needing an organ than there are available donor hearts. And so people, many people die waiting for a heart, uh, mm. you know, so. Um, what but, percentage but 4, approximately of people who are waiting for a heart die before they get one, do you know? That I don't know, and it's very yeah. center dependent. Uh, you know, depending on how aggressive the center is at listing more like sicker patients, et cetera. So, that uh, I'm not sure, but it's definitely a metric that all centers are compared on is their wait list mortality and things like that. But that's a tough metric because if you're a more aggressive center listing sicker patients, trying to get them an organ, I don't know if your wait list mortality, really, what that signifies is right. very tough versus it's like difficult. how successful are the heart transplants that you're doing. Because right. we don't have control over when an organ becomes available. Is right. there a national center that, that kind of keeps track of the whole country, or oh, yeah. is it, there yeah. is? 
Yeah, so if you need a heart, let's say in New York at Columbia, and there happens to be one in uh, California, can you, can you get that one? Yes. So I do corneal transplants, and yeah. we have a national center that keeps track of all the local centers, and occasionally I've used corneas that come from California or Seattle or Nevada, you know, wherever. Yeah, so we're, it, there are, it's more at the local level. So they're, at the government federal level, we're regulated by, like, we need, every center has to have a certain, you know, uh, uh, success in terms of their, their survival rates and right. things like that. That's regulated at the federal level. But the, but the, way donors are allocated is more regional level so there are different organ procurement organizations or opos and that that's based on geographic region so uh, in our region we have one um, and they are responsible for uh, identifying and speaking with the donor families and coordinating the donation because one donor may donate multiple organs not just a heart hopefully right. but maybe uh, lungs, kidney, pancreas, cornea, things right. like that. The difference between cornea and heart is that the heart has the shortest ischemic time allowed, right? So what that means is really the heart can only exist without a blood supply feeding the heart muscle for really uh, ideally four hours, but you can go more, like six four. hours, right? So wow. you can definitely go six hours, but once you get past four, you're starting to get, and in kids, I think they tolerate a little bit better, but you really, to me, I always think I want this heart in within four hours with blood flow going to it, um, you know, because that will be ideally better. Uh, but you can go up to six, but it's got the shortest ischemic time compared to any other organ in the body, so... For us, you know, we can only travel so far. There are new organ systems that may facilitate, you know, the heart being perfused in some way outside of the body. It's kind of trippy seeing the heart beating on a machine right. uh, when it comes. But, you know, so that's getting push, pushing that ischemic time or it's not really ischemia, but outside of the body and travel time. Ischemia um, means reduction in oxygen yeah, supply. Yeah, right. so the time out of the body then is a little bit different, right? Because it's not just sitting there in ice, like in an ice cooler, which is a traditional way of doing it. Right. Um, but if it's on one of those machines that they're saying now we can get toward, you know, 12 hours or so, but it's hard to say. Um, but either way, from a travel standpoint, it can't be too far. Right? Too far. So you've got to be available all the time, right? You can get a call. We've got a heart for you, and it could be two in the morning on, on a Saturday. And all the time, and it's always all overnight. The it's, it's heart all transplants are always overnight, uh, almost always. It's rare that we get lucky enough for them to be during the day, but, uh, you know, it's just the way things work because uh, it has to coordinate a bunch of different teams and, and things like that but yeah you're on call uh i mean we always have one surgeon on call for transplant it's not right. always me right uh on the pete right. side thankfully i have great partners and oh, you good. know we take turns and and but yeah you can get a call at any time and my cardiology colleagues usually field those calls and then talk to us about uh, whether an organ is acceptable or not and 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 then we make a decision about it well, hopefully that'll improve, because I remember when I first started doing corneal transplants, we had one or two days that the cornea would survive. Yeah. Uh, over the years, we found how to store corneas better and better solutions, and now we can go five days. That's amazing. So I used to be doing all my transplants in the middle of the night, like you, but now I can schedule them a day or two later, and hopefully that will occur with hearts as well. That's my hope. It would be great to make a heart transplant an elective operation. Right, yeah. right. Um, what about donor matching? Do you have to match the tissue types? Well, corneas, as I mentioned earlier, is an immunologically privileged site. We don't have to match tissues with corneal transplants because corneas don't have blood vessels in them. What about the heart? Do you have to match the donor and the host? Yes. So you, do. you match the blood type, right? right. So um, it sort of follows the same blood typing as um, as a blood transfusion, right? So okay. uh, you can't put, at least in kids over two years old, like in kids under two years old, we can actually disregard that and do something called an exchange transfusion where we uh, because they haven't formed uh, 
uh, antibodies really yet to the b different blood groups. So you can go incompatible against uh, ABO blood groups under you know 16 months, or maybe they may get pushed out to two years depending. But um, but everyone else like older than that, you have to follow blood blood types. Um, and match blood types, but you also, you know, and a lot of our patients in pediatrics have had prior heart surgeries, and mm -hmm. so a lot of them have s certain, have been sensitized to certain HLA, so you also sometimes have to match on HLA type also with cross matches. So that's why it has a shortage, because it's not only getting heart, but it has to be a specific type of heart. Yeah, usually we find a heart, like, it's rare, I think, that a lot of hearts go to waste if they're usable hearts, though. It's more that we just don't have enough donors. Right. How do you decide when a person needs a heart transplant? Yeah. What, what are the indications for doing that? Because obviously there's major surgery, life-changing. How do you decide who needs that? It's really when you've exhausted all other options, uh, you know, because the heart transplant is a heart replacement therapy, right? And so... You know, if there is something mechanical in the heart you can fix, say it's a, a bad valve or things like that, or the arteries are blocked and they're just, the heart function is not good because it's not getting enough blood flow, you can do a bypass. You know, they're, they're, so we try to do all those things. And then if it's just, if, if they have heart failure for other reasons, are there medicines that can help them? So if they're still symptomatic and it's affecting their life and there's nothing else we can do for them, then we offer heart transplantation. So it's kind of last resort when you've exhausted yeah. all other medical and less aggressive surgical measures. Definitely. Right. Uh, makes sense. Are there devices that you can use to aid a, a failing heart to, to prevent going to uh, the transplant? Absolutely. So, um, and those technologies have really progressed over the years. Um, you know, those are called uh, LVADs or left ventricular assist devices. Um, there are even total artificial hearts now that work for both uh, both sides of the heart. But in general, uh, you know, LVADs are a pump that we tend to use just for the left ventricular side. That is not; it doesn't really beat, but they sit inside the body and they pump. They they uh, are connected to the left ventricle and then connected to the aorta, which is the outflow of the heart, and they pump blood continuously for the heart. So it takes off the, the need for the heart uh, to pump blood to the body. So if the heart muscle isn't working that well, this is a pump that uh, assists the heart. Correct. Where is that implanted? Near, near Insi the heart? Inside the chest, uh, and, it, and it goes right from the right at the tip of the heart. Uh, is where it enters the heart, and then it, there's a tube that comes around and goes up to the aorta. So all within the chest, but um, the, the downsides of it is not a cure-all, right? So the, the drawbacks are that when there's a drive line, so you know there has to be a power source, so you have to connect it to a battery, um, and that drive line power cord comes out around here, like uh, in, the, in the abdomen, and then two, you have to be on a blood thinner. Uh, hmm. But the hemocompatibility profiles of these different devices are getting better. Um, and, you know, with transcutaneous charging technologies and things like that hopefully being invented, you know, the sky's the limit for um, heart pump, mechanical heart pump technology. So right now it's going through skin and then there's a risk of infection as Correct. well. Yeah. yeah. And that could spread into the heart, potentially travel along the pump. Yep. The tubes. Yep. But there are people who are not candidates for heart transplants, and we put these in as a what we call destination therapy. Um, but then we also use these sometimes for people to get stronger, so that they can so they can have a heart transplant. So as a bridge to transplant. Um, right. These devices are too big for a lot of kids, so we have other devices, uh, but they're not. Um, but those are externalized, so those are only as a bridge to a transplant. Yeah, I have a patient, a, a woman who's about 80 years old, and she has one of these devices, and she carries around a battery pack with yep. her, comes to my office, and I'm always nervous that the battery's going to, yeah. you know, not, uh, not be working. Well, but they always have a backup battery. They uh, do, and, right. She uh, travels with a backup battery, and uh, she's and, doing three years, and, and she's getting around and well. The quality of life studies, people feel a lot better with it. So yeah. it's definitely life-changing. Um, Hopefully for the good. I guess the question becomes, when does a VAD 
conquer transplant, you know? Right. Yeah. Time will tell. Yeah. How long does a heart transplant operation take in, uh, in a child and an adult, yeah, or, uh, I, on the average? On the average, uh, probably about eight hours. Like, eight hours. Yeah, six to eight hours, depending. Uh, and it can be longer, like especially in pediatrics where kids have had maybe three, four, five operations and before. So they have scar tissue. Tons of scar tissue. And, so, and a lot of times they've had a, the whole circulation rerouted, so you then have to undo all of that and reroute mm -hmm. it to, to accept a normal anatomy heart, right? Because they were born with abnormal anatomy. Right. So you may have to reroute the veins and the arteries and patch things. So it's it, it's a lot, but um, uh, but yeah, typically about six to eight hours, and it requires multiple teams. Um, right. Tell us about the team. How many people are in the OR with you for the six to eight hour period? Yeah. So not even just with me, but we'll talk about who's with me and who's uh, going to get the donor heart. Right. So I have uh, in my in in the team doing the heart transplant. So if I'm doing the heart transplant, I also have an assistant surgeon with me. Usually that's a trainee, but uh, it could be uh, another attending surgeon as so well. So it's a resident or a uh, fellow yeah. that you're training to, Correct. to do this surgery. Yes. So you're also teaching and training while you're doing this. Exactly. Um, and then there's a scrub nurse who's trained to like hand, like be a part of the operation and hands you the instruments in a timely fashion and the sutures. There's a circulating nurse um, also in the operating room uh, who is not scrubbed into the surgery. Uh, there are two perfusionists uh, that run the heart and lung machine, um, which is what's being used to give oxygenated blood uh, to the body uh, to take to bypass the work of the heart and the lungs while you're doing any um, heart surgery. Um, and in the case of a heart transplant, for a while, there's no heart inside the body, so you right. need that machine, obviously. Right. Um, and then uh, uh, usually there's a, well, there's, for me, there's a pediatric cardiac anesthesiologist who's done training in anesthesia, peds, and cardiac anesthesia. And that's, then, that's another uh, 10 another years long of path training, like. right? And then, and then usually a fellow that they have or a resident that they have. So... Uh, that's a lot of people. I didn't count that, but right. uh, there's a lot. And then on top of it, I have a team that I have to send out usually, and it's another surgeon or it's a fellow um, who's trained in procuring the hearts because that's a surgery in and of itself, right? They have to go right. to the donor hospital and evaluate the heart and then um, uh, collect the heart uh, in a way that we can then sew it in uh, so carefully and also protect the heart so that um, it is stored in a, in a safe fashion so that um, it will work when it comes to us. Right, so you need a, a heart surgeon to remove the heart from the donor, right? Yes. Because they have to know how to Correct. preserve all the blood vessels, the muscles, the Absolutely. arteries. Absolutely. That's uh, And pretty, then they usually have an assistant and they have a perfusionist to perfuse the preservation solution. So it's a lot. What is the preservation solution? What do you what do you keep the heart in? in? It it depends on 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 your center, but usually it's um, some form of solution that one stops the heart so that its metabolic rate is not um, is much less, uh, and it's usually a cold solution. Cold. Right? So, um, and those are like the two main things, and and so you want a decompressed heart that's that's cold to decrease the metabolic rate and not beating. Right, you hear occasionally stories of a young kid who drowns and is underwater for 15 minutes and somehow survives. Yeah. And that's because the water is cold and preserves the organs. Yeah. So that's basically the same thing you're doing here. Yeah. Or similar. Similar, yeah. Right, that, that's pretty amazing. How do you get a team together at Saturday night at 2 a.m.? It's like you mentioned like 10 or 12 people. How do you everybody's get all... Everybody's on call. Everybody's on call. If you're a heart transplant center, you have to have those capabilities because you don't get to choose when a donor becomes available. Uh, and you have to be able to mobilize. And, and, and everyone gets excited for a heart transplant because you're giving somebody a new chance. Life. Yeah. Right. Well, that, that's amazing. 
What's the uh, post-operative course like after a heart transplant? What activities can people do and, and what can't they do? I actually know an ophthalmologist who had a heart transplant and he's actually running and doing races and things like that. Is yeah, that I mean, uh, so usually in the hospital for a couple of weeks um, as you get adjusted to the new organ and then usually there's you know, we have to initiate the immunosuppression and then you have at least one biopsy um, while you're in the hospital and a catheterization to measure the blood pressures inside the heart to make sure that all of that is working well um, and, and make sure there's no rejection, right? So right. Uh, that's done with biopsies in the cath lab. Uh, and so usually in the hospital for a couple of weeks there. And then after about a month, you can start like increasing your activity level. Just from the sternotomy itself, opening this chest, we usually restrict heavy lifting to more than five pounds for four weeks, and then people can start to mobilize more. Right, you don't want those incisions to break exactly. from, from straining. And, um, but then, yeah, I mean, uh, pretty, you should have a, a, you know, you're gonna have a lot of doctor's appointments, obviously, right. and you have to be monitored for rejection, you have to take your immunosuppression, so, it's not to say that your life is truly normal uh, from that perspective, but yeah, there's no, there's no contraindication to running or running a marathon. You, you, really? you read those stories about people running marathons right. and things like that. So that's yeah. that's all true. That's yeah. amazing. Now, if you transplant a pediatric heart, it's obviously smaller than an adult heart. Does that heart grow with mm -hmm. with the, it does? Yeah, it will grow, uh, and uh, and yeah, that's some of the premise behind the valves too, actually. The valves grow too. Yeah, everything grows. That's uh, amazing. Yeah, that, that's pretty incredible. And what about you mentioned earlier about uh, mechanical hearts made out of plastics or various metals? How how are those progressing? Are are we near transplanting just a plastic metal heart or not really? It's mostly the the VAD devices the, and the total artificial hearts. So total artificial hearts are a thing. They're still kind of big. They're getting better, uh, but it's a lot of foreign material that your blood surface contacts. So uh, trying to improve upon hemocompatibility, the valves that are within those things in the pumps have to work well. Um, so it, it's a work in progress, but newer total artificial hearts are coming out. Um, uh, so, and in the pipeline. Again, they're big, so they don't really fit kids. Uh, so mm. I'm not as, um, uh, I don't interact with those as much. Right. So now I want to talk about uh, heart transplants from pigs to humans. That's been in the news the last couple of years. There are a few institutions and centers where that was done, including at NYU, where I'm on faculty, mm -hmm. and I think University of Maryland as right. well. Uh, why transplant a pig heart into a human? So uh, the biggest reason is the donor shortage, right? And donor so uh, if you think about like uh, there's a large population of people that, uh, that need a heart transplant. Right. Then there's a smaller population of people that are listed for heart transplant because they are, are eligible for it. And then an even smaller number of people that are transplanted. And that difference is because there's not enough donors available. We need donor hearts. Um, and so xenotransplantation, which is by definition transplanting uh, an organ from a different species into another species, right? right? Um, and in this case, it's pigs into humans, uh, offers a potential opportunity to uh, get rid of the organ shortage uh, if you can get it to work. Now, uh, for it to be very successful, though, you need a couple things, right? You need, uh, you need to have a successfully transplanted organ, but you also need, in my opinion, to try to the goal would be to induce some form of tolerance, meaning uh, being able to do a transplant without significant, without immunosuppression, right? And so uh, right now in xenotransplantation, because it's cross species, people are trying different things, but it still requires a lot of immunosuppression, like more than a standard human heart transplant, uh, human to human. And so uh, that so far is something that we need to work on. 
Right, so just explain to, to the audience out there, it, when you transplant from one human to another, uh, the humans have different tissues and the, the host will try to reject a donor heart from a human. Mm -hmm. If you're using a pig heart, that's very radically different than, right. than a human, so there's even more of a rejection reaction, right? A hundred percent. So, right. um, so, so pigs, for example, they make a certain carbohydrate that we call gal um, or alpha gal and that we have what we call natural antibodies so our innate immune system and our natural antibody ha we have natural antibodies circulating in our bloodstream that will recognize gal right mm. uh, and so if you just took a regular pig heart and put it into a, a human it would have hyperacute rejection. As, like, as soon as the blood comes in contact with this new heart, the um, antibodies, those natural antibodies, will bind the endothelial cells and activate complement and create, a, you know, uh, and kill the organ. Right. So uh, the way we've done it now is that we've knocked out some of those genes in the pigs. Uh, such a, so that they don't make gal, right? And and they've gone on to do the ones that they've done at NYU and Maryland have had ten genetic modifications, uh, whether it's knocking out genes like or or adding some in, adding some human genes in um, to try to make it more compatible, uh, mm. so that you don't immediately reject it. Getting rid of gal, I think, gets rid of hyperacute rejection but you okay. still have the longer delayed term. rejection exactly mm -hmm. and so those are all things we need to deal with um, right but it's certainly very exciting time I mean Dino transplant started back many decades ago you know like the most famous one I would say was baby Faye that I think a lot of us know about and she was that was I think that was 1984 in the 1980s um, she was a newborn and needed a heart transplant. And in Loma Linda, they transplanted a baboon heart into her. Uh, it lasted, she, she lived for like, uh, I think like 21 days, three weeks or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, so she was very famous and, but since then, you know, chimpanzees and baboons, they're non-human primates. You can't really, it's hard to breed them, farm them. Ethically, it's hard. They're closer to us. Right. Um, so pigs were sort of the natural, um, hmm. I think, animal that sort of has has become the main animal for xenotransplantation, um, especially with gal knockout now. Um, and now with CRISPR technology where you can edit genes, you can add right. a lot in. Uh, so right now, so the idea would be that you could have a whole farm of animals of organs that you could then Trans use to transplant, and if yeah, they're they've identical, transplanted transplant. Yeah, they've transplanted uh, pig kidneys as well. They're they're yep. doing they're doing that as well. Yep, uh, pig kidneys, and so at pig kidneys at, at recently um, at NYU and at MGH. Yeah. Right, they've done that. Now the the pig heart is is similar in size and structure and function to the human heart. Pretty similar. Yes, very similar. Very so similar. four chambers, same number of valves, same type of valves. Um, uh, it they do grow a lot faster than we do, right? Like uh, so, really, a pig reaches a, adult size very quickly. Right. Uh, you know, and so for pediatrics, that's a big question. Like if we put a baby pig heart into a, a baby human, a pig will grow to reach adult size within months. Right. And a human takes years. You know, will it outgrow? We don't know these things. Some, some oh. of these genetic engineer hearts have growth hormone receptor knockouts and uh, things like that. So it's, it's, it's still we're still learning um i think you know but from a functional standpoint it's the same circulation same and, circulation. and relatively same size but you can tell a difference when you look at a pig heart and a human heart you you know that it it's different can you tell i uh, i mean i can't tell but how about 
Yeah, I mean, yes. I, I Externally, like if you yeah. just showed them to me from far yeah, if, away, if I might If you not. have two coolers with a, yeah. with a human heart and a pig heart, and I ask you which is human, yeah. which yeah. is pig, w would you be able to tell me? Or they look so similar that it would be... If I had a close look at it, like because there are certain things about the aortic valve that I oh. know to be different... Um, but just externally, but externally, without, like from across the room. Yeah, no, I wouldn't be able to. Really, tell you. I don't think I would. Wow, uh, that's yeah. pretty incredible. Similar artery, artery. That's why they're used for translational research, right? Too, because right. they have uh, similar things. They even use for surgical training. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Now, if the chimpanzee issue wasn't an ethical issue, and if it was more easy to raise uh, chimpanzees. They're supposedly our closest relative. I think their genes are like 98% the same as us. Yeah. Would they be a more ideal candidate or, or not really, or we just don't know? I, I don't know the answer to that, probably. I mean, they're, they're more similar, uh, so, so potentially yes, but it's an ethical dilemma. And, right. you know, uh, you know, the pigs, one of the benefits is that they can be inbred and, and so that they're s genetically identical, every single one, right? And so if, right. You, needed so it's just more practical. if you needed to retransplant them, you could retransplant them from another pig and it would be like receiving the same organ again. Right. Uh, so I, I don't know I don't know the answer about the chimpanzees. Plus they grow to adult yeah. size quicker, so yeah. it's, just, it's just practicality makes it easier. Yeah. Now, you mentioned uh, gene editing. So the gene editing, removing certain genes from the pig heart or putting in new genes to create proteins that are more similar to the human proteins, that's done in, in pig embryos, right? Yeah. So you're, you're taking a pig embryo, you're using CRISPR and other technologies to change the genetics of that pig to make it more human-like. Yeah. And then you put that embryo into uh, a female pig uterus and it grows. And then the, the baby pigs have the human protein characteristics. Is that how it's done? I believe so, but yeah. I, I, you know, the pigs You're not that, out, so they don't uh, call you to help no, raise the pigs? I don't, no. I'm not <laughs> part of that process, um, but the pigs, um, you know, there's different ways of doing it. I think one of the issues that comes to mind with that process is how many can you generate a year? Are you going to fix an organ donor shortage if it takes that much work to make? Like, how many can right. you produce a year versus if you're just breeding them? You know, like, uh, like once you have... So that kind of brings it to question how many knock, like genes are you going to put in, put out? Cause right. Like, it's a little bit faster to just breed them as in like just with regular breeding techniques if you've already knocked out the gene but that's a it's a that's a question that's unanswered right now still unanswered yeah but we're working on it have yeah. have they done any xeno transplants that's trans species at at columbia or is it just nyu and maryland now the, the heart in humans it's been nyu and for heart, it's been NYU and Maryland. Maryland mm -hmm. did the first two uh, living human heart transplants um, in two patients that were deemed not candidates for human to human heart transplant. Right. The first one um, lasted about, that patient lived two months, about 60 days. Mm -hmm. The heart itself lasted about 48 days or something like that before they wound up on life support again. Um, and that was due to a pig infection, actually, that was unrecognized, they believe. Right, the pigs have certain virus. Exactly. That can't affect a human cell. So, like, even, right. if you get, even if you get a pig heart that has a porcine CMV, is what it was, a virus, it can't affect your cells. But, but it, it will affect the heart. the heart. And then you will reject the heart because it will cause inflammation, et cetera. Right. And so, um, so I think that we believe that's what the from what they've released is the reason why the first uh, the first patient uh, uh, died. The second patient uh, lived shorter, uh, I think about a month or so, uh, and that was they believe due to rejection of the organ. Now NYU has done an interesting model. They have not done xenotransplants in hearts into living patients. They've done it in brain-dead patients. So like the mm -hmm. same type of patient 
who would be an organ donor, they are now they have uh, done, they have approached those their families to say, would you be willing uh, to you to let your uh, um, brain dead relative be a part of research, and they have then uh, done something incredibly, those families have done something incredibly noble. Hi, it's Dr. Robert Seichert. That was an excellent discussion with Dr. Andrew Goldstone about heart transplants and especially xenotransplants where we transplant pig hearts into humans. We're going to have a second part to that interview in the very near future. Thanks for tuning in. And again, Please subscribe and follow Dr. Podcast because the more you subscribe and follow, the more guests we can have on and the more interesting guests we can have as well. And please also click on the like button and the repost button so that other people can watch this episode as well. Thank you.